Hey, so we're starting a new chapter, chapter 14. Um, it's entitled Particle Physics. And today, before we get started on some of the hot new physics that's going on today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the history and how we got where we got. So the Greek philosopher Empedocles asserted that matter consisted of four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And you'll probably still hear some new age types say this kind of thing now. Uh, now we know, though, that the, there's lots more elements than just earth, air, fire, and water. And earth, air, fire, and water are actually themselves not elements at all. Um, <laughs> but we've moved on. So this idea um, of the four elements was supported and embellished by Aristotle. And the concept influenced the philosophical basis for the next advance in the science of matter, which was alchemy. Now, Democritus, um, he lived um, around three to four hundred years um, before the Common Era. They're not really exactly sure, so these dates listed here are approximate dates for um, his life. But he was an influential pre-Socratic pre philosopher, and he was a pupil of Lysippus, who formulated what is thought to be the first atomic theory. Democritus actually claimed that everything is made of atoms, and these atoms are physically but not geometrically indivisible, and between atoms lies empty space, and that atoms are indestructible, and they have always been and always will be in motion, and there's an infinite number of atoms and kinds of atoms which differ in shape and size. Now this was a pretty good theory for the time. Um, he reasoned that the solidness of the material actually uh, corresponded to the shape of the atom involved. So he thought that iron atoms were solid and strong with these hooks in them that locked into a solid, and water atoms are smooth and slippery, and salt atoms, because of their taste, are sharp and pointed. Air atoms are light and whirling, and he used analogies from the four senses to give us an image of the atom that distinguished them from each other by the shape and size. Now, there was a lot about the, the things that, that were wrong with this theory, but there's also a lot that was right about this theory. It's true that, you know, unless you have a buttload of energy, atoms are pretty indivisible. Um, and between atoms, we do have a lot of empty space. Um, they aren't indestructible. You can bust them up. Um, you can divide them. But you do need quite a bit of speed and energy to do that. Um, they are in motion. Um, unless you go down to absolute zero, where they're at their zero point energy, but even then they're still in motion. Um, he was wrong about the shapes. They're all kind of spherical. But he was right in some ways and wrong in others. So it was a really interesting theory for the time. The next probably really big advance in thought came from John Dalton, who's considered to be the father of chemistry. He lived in 1766 to 1844. And he came up with these kind of five postulates that uh, were very accurate. Elements are made of extremely small particles called atoms. Atoms of a given element are identical in size, mass, and other properties, and atoms of different elements differ in size, mass, and other properties. They can't be subdivided, created, or destroyed. Atoms of different elements combine in simple whole number ratios to form chemical compounds, and in chemical reactions, atoms are combined, separated, and rearranged. So, I mean, I think this is awesome. He's right about everything except number three. Atoms can be subdivided. Um, they're not really created anymore. <laughs> They're sort of combined from other parts, um, and they can be smashed up. So if you think of that as destruction, then they sure can, OK? Um, now, Dalton used his own symbols to visually represent the atomic structure of compounds. Compounds are listed as binary, ternary, quaternary, etc. in his text, which was entitled The New System of Chemical Philosophy. And he hypothesized that the structure of compounds could be represented in whole number ratios. And here's some sketches from his textbook over here um, with the binary and the ternary and the quaternary and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, the father of modern chemistry with a pretty accurate picture of the atom. The next advance came in 1897 from Thomson's experiments. So, Thomson's experiments in 1897 basically showed that you can bust up an atom, and you can get electrons out of it when you do. 
okay? He developed the plum pudding model of the atom, which you might remember from modern one. If you don't, um, remember that the plum pudding model, it was supposed to be sort of like a Christmas pudding, a British dessert, um, where it had a dough, and he thought of the dough as the positive matrix or what the atom was made of. And then he pictured the electrons embedded in this dough like little raisins in a plum pudding. Okay, so that was uh, Thompson's plum pudding model of the atom. The gold foil experiments in 1906 to 1908 by Rutherford disproved the model and led to a theory of a dense positive nucleus. Um, and then uh, from there, Bohr took over and he developed sort of a planetary model of the atom with the nucleus at the center, sort of like the sun and the electrons moving about in circular orbits. And then it took quantum mechanics um, to develop the theory of the atom that we have now with the orbitals that are dictated by the Schrodinger equation. Um, in 1932, James Chadwick actually suggested the existence of a neutron um, to help explain why atomic weights were larger can, than could be explained by protons alone. And now you have your modern conception of the atom. So this is sort of the beginning of beginnings of atomic theory. What we're going to talk about in this chapter goes on from there. And to do that, we kind of have to talk about Dirac. Now, Dirac may be my favorite physicist. He is hilarious to me. Um, he was a brilliant, brilliant mathematician. Uh, but there's a lot of really colorful and interesting stories um, from his past. He, um, he said he was a very quiet, sort of taciturn man. When he did speak, people listened because they knew that what he was going to say was pretty important. He was the Lucasian um, professor of mathematics at Cambridge. And he shared the Nobel Prize in 1933 with Schrodinger for the discovery of new productive forms of atomic theory. So he was a very outspoken um, atheist, actually, and one of his friends, Wolfgang Pauli, said, well, our friend Dirac has got religion, and its guiding principle is there is no God, and Paul Dirac is his prophet. So that was Wolfgang Pauli that said that about him. And then everybody laughed, including Dirac. Um, we'll talk about uh, a sort of counterexample in a few minutes, so if you're getting offended by the atheist comment, just hang in. Um, Heisenberg and Dirac, actually, were on a cruise ship to a conference in Japan in August of 1929, and Heisenberg was quite the ladies' man. So they were both still in their 20s, and they were unmarried, and they sort of made an odd couple because Heisenberg was a ladies' man, and he constantly flirted and danced, and Dirac was an Edwardian geek, um, and he really didn't like to socialize and make small talk. It was quite painful for him. So do you dance? Why do you dance? Dirac asked his companion, and uh, Heisenberg replied, well, when there's nice girls, it's a pleasure, and Dirac really thought that over, and then he said, but Heisenberg how do you know beforehand that the girls are nice? So that's the story. Who knows if it's true, but it's pretty funny. But all kidding aside, he came up with um, some really important concepts and equations which really advanced quantum theory and particle physics. So Dirac's equation is actually a relativistic wave equation. I'll show it to you in a second. And it helps unite relativity with Schrodinger's wave equation. Remember that Schrodinger um, published his equation. He was a little dissatisfied with it at the time because it didn't cover relativistic um, physics. But Dirac sort of bridged that gap. So. Dirac um, introduced a hypothesis known as whole theory, and whole theory says that the vacuum, basically nothingness, is actually something. It's a mini-body quantum state in which all there's these negative energy electron eigenstates um, occupied. So when I say negative energy, I mean negative mass energy. In other words, it doesn't exist, okay? There's nothingness. And within that nothingness, there is the potential, the possibility for the existence of a particle. Okay, so it's a negative energy eigenstate. Um, it was thought of the vacuum as sort of a sea of electrons or possible electrons, and they coined the term Dirac C. And since the Pauli exclusion principle actually forbids electrons from occupying the same state, then any additional electron would be forced to occupy a positive energy eigenstate. So basically, here's this sea of nothingness, but it's actually filled of negative mass energy eigenstates, right, populated. And then if anything is added to the sea, then pop into existence comes an electron because it's forced into a higher energy level, which is the existence of somethingness, having mass, okay? So um, positive energy electrons would be forbidden then from decaying into a negative energy eigenstate once they're into existence. And so that is a very wordy and long way to sort of conceptualize and describe this equation here, which is the equation that he's famous for.
Now, if you look at this equation and remember some concepts from modern one, remember we introduced the Schrodinger equation there. And it was basically um, your, uh, on the right hand side, you had IH bar partial of your wave function with respect to time. So the right hand side there matches Schrodinger's equation. And then you can see on the left hand side, there's your, um, there's your wave function again, okay? Now, there's other things that we can identify in here. So that PK, that's the momentum operator that we talked about in modern one. C, of course, is the speed of light. Here's your MC squared, okay, for your mass energy. And then alpha and beta in here, these are four by four matrices, okay? These are four by four matrices. So this is actually an equation. Um, excuse me for just a second. Sorry. So this is actually an equation that has really embedded in it four equations because these are four by four matrices. And this wave function here is a vector equation. And it's uh, a vector and it's got four components. Um, it's called the bispinner. And the uh, two components are spin up and spin down electrons. And then the other two components are the spin up and the spin down positrons. Remember we discussed that the positron was the antiparticle of the electron, it has the same mass but the opposite charge, okay? So um, this equation right here describes um, the Dirac C and the existence and the creation of electrons from this vacuum of nothingness. So he reasoned that if the negative energy eigenstates are incompletely filled, that each unoccupied eigenstate called a hole would behave like a positively charged particle. And this hole would possess a positive energy, since energy would be required to create the particle hole pair from the vacuum. And as noted, Dirac initially thought that the hole might be the proton, but another physicist named Weil pointed out that the hole should behave as if it had the same mass as the electron, whereas the proton was much, much heavier. So the hole was eventually identified as a positron, um, and then that positron was experimentally discovered by Carl Anderson in 1932. And we're going to talk about him in just a second. So the idea of particles and antiparticles came out of the mind of Dirac from this relativistic Schrodinger equation type thing. Okay, now, how was this all experimentally verified? Well, to begin with that, we have to start with cosmic rays, okay? So, about 100 years ago, cosmic radiation was discovered by Austrian physicist Victor Franz Hess, okay? Cosmic rays are highly energetic nuclei that cross interstellar space and enter our atmosphere. Before the development of particle accelerators, cosmic ray research led to the discovery of many important elementary particles, among them, of course, the antiparticle of the electron, the positron, as well as the muon and the pion. So, Hess did his experiments in these balloons. He won the Nobel Prize in 1936. So they actually used to think that cosmic rays came from a source on the Earth. But what Hess's work did was he showed that the ionizing radiation levels decreased up to about one kilometer. So you had ionizing radi radiation near the surface of the Earth that might be coming from the Earth. But then as you moved away from the Earth in the balloon, the radiation levels decreased when you went up to about a kilometer. But then after the kilometer, they started to pick back up again. And then the highest levels he found were about five kilometers up. And he found that those levels were about two times the levels of radiation that you would encounter at sea level. So clearly what was happening, according to Hess, was that there was this radiation coming from interstellar space. And um, very close to the surface of the Earth, a lot of that radiation was taken out before it got there because it was stopped by our air. Air, okay, but if you got further up in the sky and got less air in between you and interstellar space, then you could see the radiation again. These balloon experiments, they're actually quite dangerous, okay, um, because he did go so very high up to conduct them, uh, and, and it was a really dangerous kind of crazy experiment to do, which probably contributed that along with his um, amazing results to his Nobel Prize. Now, just to contrast with Dirac, I told you I'd provide a counterexample. Hess wrote about the relationship between science and religion, and in 1946, he wrote an article that he entitled My Faith, in which he explained his belief in God. So there was a pretty strong debate going on in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and even now amongst the scientific community about this sort of thing. It's a really interesting study in history and philosophy if you want to look into it. There's been a lot of uh, really cool books written about it. Which I'm not going to get too much into in this class.
Now, enter Carl Anderson. Um, Carl Anderson's pictured here, along with his experimental setup there in the middle, and then on the left, some of the um, experiments uh, results from the cloud chamber. They used cloud chambers and cosmic rays, and they used, they were the first, his group was the first to actually detect the positron, which validated Dirac's work um, in 1932. And he was also the first to discover the muon, a particle that at first they thought might be really important to nuclear physics because they thought it might be the mediating particle for the strong force. Um, we'll talk more about that concept later, what I mean by mediating particle. But the muon was something of a disappointment um, because it turned out not to have the right mass to be that particle. Um, and so there was a physicist at the time when um, he announced his discovery, uh, when Anderson announced his discovery of the muon that said, who ordered that? Because it didn't seem to fulfill any real purpose <laughs> in physics, which is kind of funny. Um, so the positron was the first of the antiparticles to be discovered, um, but by no means is it the last. And it's now believed that for every particle, there's an antiparticle. And this is from Dirac's version of quantum mechanics, of course, that inco incorporated special relativity. And this has been verified for all the particles known today. And I'm going to show you a chart. Some particles are actually their own antiparticles, um, the photon, the pion, for a couple of examples. An antiparticle will always have um, the same mass as its corresponding particle, but it's going to have an opposite charge. And as we'll talk about later, it also has opposite color and all this kind of other stuff, but we'll get into that in a minute. Um, since then, the positron has been observed tons of times since 1932, as have many of these antiparticles. Now, um, I'm going to show you this. Please do look at it in more detail, and there's also charts in your book. Um, these are the hadrons. We'll talk about what that means in a little bit. But basically, it's sort of a laundry list of particles with specific properties. You can see the ones that we're really familiar with down here, the protons and the neutrons. But there's lambdas, sigmas, omegas, charmed lambdas, kaons, pions, etas, and all that kind of stuff. Most of these particles really aren't very stable on their own. The lifetimes are listed here. Um, so did you know, for example, that a neutron is not really stable on its own? It only lasts about 886 seconds on average. Uh, the proton is pretty much the only stable hadron on that list and that it can sit there all by itself and not decay into something else. Um, a lot of these particles, though, they have lifetimes that are on the order of 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9 seconds. If you look at the lifetimes, though, when it says the antiparticle and self, okay, then those are super unstable particles. You can imagine that if you're your own antiparticle, you're not going to last very long. So to contrast, for example, the, the Ds and the charm Ds, they have lifetimes in the order of 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 13 seconds. But the things that are on their own antiparticle list, they have lifetimes in the order of 10 to the minus 17 to 10 to the minus 20 seconds. So there's are some super short lifetimes um, there. Um, how can a particle be its own antiparticle, you might ask? Well, the particle, first of all, it has to have no net charge because one of the hallmarks of having a particle-antiparticle pair is that they be of opposite charge. So you have to be neutrally charged to be your own antiparticle. And the decay modes for the particle have to contain products that are either self-particle antiparticles or contain the particle-antiparticle pair. So that's the rules for classification, saying that you're all an antiparticle. Basically, though, in, in summation, if you take a reaction and you reverse it, you're going to get the antiparticle, okay? So, for example, here we have a proton and an electron combining to form a neutron and a neutrino. If you reverse that, then you have a neutron decaying to become a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino, okay? So there you go. Now, a photon is considered to be its own um, antiparticle. So if you take, for example, an electron and a positron, they combine to make a photon, you reverse it, and you get an electron and a positron again. So um, it's its own antiparticle, and of course it has no net charge. Now we discussed in Modern One that a common source of positrons is what's called pair production. We discussed them, this when we were discussing Einstein's famous equation E is equal to mc squared. And we talked about how you can take two particles that have mass that are 
particle antiparticle pairs and combine them and get pure energy just like that electron plus positron equals photon thing that I showed you just a second ago so that's pair production in pair production you have a gamma ray photon because that's the only thing with enough energy um, and it has to have two times the rest mass of the particle that you're trying to create right um, because you're going to create the particle antiparticle pair so you have a gamma ray photon that has that much energy 2mc squared um, and then it's going to interact and pass by a nucleus remember we said that it had to be it hit, this couldn't happen in empty space because of momentum conservation so it has to be passing by a nucleus to transfer some of the momentum and then um, you'll have some pair production so if you need a review on that you can look back at the earlier chapters we covered that in modern one and so in cloud chambers like this one, basically, um, you can insert radiation into an area that has sort of a less dense kind of um, atmosphere with nuclei in it, but less dense. And then um, you have a vapor inside the chamber, which is why it's called a cloud chamber. You have a vapor in there. And as the um, charged particles are created by the gamma ray photons, the charged particles will leave a little track, a little detectable track of water vapor, water droplets behind when they pass through okay and so you can tell if you put a strong magnetic field through that region the charged particles are going to make circles as is shown there on the left because of the magnetic field and positively charged particles will circle one way in the magnetic field and the negatively charged particles will circle the other way um, and that's how you can tell which is your positron and which is your electron um, you usually need more than the minimum energy, the 2mc squared, to create a lot of electrons and positrons. And then the excess energy goes into kinetic energy, which allows the particles to be carried away from each other so that they don't immediately recombine. Speaking of recombining, that's called annihilation, and it's the reverse process of pair production that can also occur, and it's when the particle-antiparticle pair meet up and then they create a photon. And this is why antimatter actually doesn't last very long in normal space because there are so very many electrons around, for example, the positron is going to find one pretty quick and annihilate and create a gamma ray. So since they started doing particle physics, they discovered tons and tons and tons of particles, okay, many different kinds. And this began in the 1940s when they discovered um, all these new particles and these high energy collisions and these atom smashers. They noticed that they were characteristically unstable, that they had short lifetimes like we talked about, like we read off the chart. There's over 300 of these suckers that have been cataloged. And because of the sheer overwhelming number, it was thought you know, that they, they needed some sort of new physics, some new pattern to understand and describe all of these new particles. There were so many that they called them the particle zoo, and some physicists got very fed up by this. Um, one of them, I think, said, if I wanted to memorize the names of all these particles, I would have been a botanist. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of their frustration with it at the time. But some really fascinating physics fell out of these discoveries and out of these um, uh, accelerators, and we're going to talk about them in the coming lectures.